Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for our presentation titled, The Role of Serum Biomarkers in Estimating the Risk of Malignancy in an Adnexal Mass, CA125 and Beyond. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Kevin Holcomb. Dr. Holcomb is an Associate Professor of Clinical Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Will Cornell Medical College, where he also serves as the Vice Chairman of Gynecology, Director of Gyneco Gynecologic Oncology, and the Associate Dean of Admissions. For a complete biography on Dr. Holcomb, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. If any questions arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit them in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions following this presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Holcomb. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, it's my pleasure to offer this presentation this morning. As you heard, I'm going to be speaking about the role of serum biomarkers in estimating the risk of malignancy in women who present with an adnexal mass. And as any of the OBGYNs in the, in the uh, audience would know, that story really has to start with CA125, the, the most commonly used serum biomarker for ovarian cancer. Um, but I enjoy talking about medical history, and I've had the opportunity to learn the story of the development of CA125 from one of my mentors. So I'd like to start actually one step beyond, behind with the, uh, the development and discovery of CA125, because I think it's an interesting story. Um, it also gives you some idea of the limitations of CA125 and why we need more accurate uh, predictors of cancer in this situation. Here are my disclosures. Um, the, I receive support for this program is provided by Abbott. The information presented is based on the speaker's interpretation of the evidence. Um, I also receive research support from Fuji Rebio Diagnostics, and I'm a consultant for Johnson & Johnson. Uh, as I mentioned, I know the story of the development of CA125 because one of my mentors uh, was a co-inventor of the, of the lab test and I told him he should write a book about his, his experience because I thought it was very educational for anybody who's pursuing clinical research. And I already developed a name for the, um, for the book. It should be called The Development of CA-125 of Mice, Men, and Miss McDonald. And I think as the story unfolds, you'll understand why. So I'm going to start the story off with this man. Um, this is my mentor, Dr. Robert C. Knapp. Um, some of you may know him. He was the former director of gynecology and gynecologic oncology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Dana-Farber Institute in Boston. As I mentioned, he was a co-inventor of CA-125. I had the pleasure of meeting him as I was interviewing to return to Wild Cornell G1 Oncology back in 2006, and he was a visiting scholar at the medical school. His story, at least with regard to CA-125, actually begins in 1970 when Dr. Knapp was recruited to Harvard by Dr. Manny Friedman, and he actually went into the uh, Department of Radiation Therapy. Uh, Dr. Knapp was very interested in developing immunotherapy for ovarian cancer. And I know a lot of people think of immunotherapy as a novel uh, idea, but clearly people have been trying to use immunotherapy to fight cancers for many, many years, Dr. Knapp included. As one might expect, in order to develop uh, treatments against ovarian cancer, you need a, a really good mouse or animal model of the disease. And one of his first um, uh, discoveries really was this ovarian cancer model in the C3 HEB FEJ mouse. Um, Dr. Knapp speaks very, very fondly of this rodent, and he uh, actually attributes this mouse to getting a tenure at Harvard. Um, so he gets there in 1970, and He's developing a mouse model, and he's really interested in looking at um, the natural history of ovarian cancer. In fact, this mouse, when transplanted with human ovarian cancers, um, actually develops a disease very similar to what you see in humans, ascites, lymphatic spread. And he's answering a lot of the questions of how this cancer spreads throughout the body through this mouse model. Like any group, you really need a critical mass, and things start moving along much faster once he recruits this man, Dr. Robert Bast. And many of you know him because Dr. Bast is such a well-known uh, name in cancer research. He's the chair for cancer research at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. 
But back in the 70s, he was doing a fellowship in medical oncology at the what was called the Sydney Farber Cancer Institute at the time. And he also was interested in immunotherapy and had done a fellowship at the NIH in, in leukemia. But when he graduated fellowship, he joined the lab of Dr. Knapp and brought his experience with immunotherapy, uh, immunology to his lab. Dr. Knapp and Dr. Bast had a good working relationship. Dr. Knapp was very clinically active and was still operating, bringing clinical samples back to the lab. Dr. Bast was in the lab really trying to develop uh, what they were trying to develop was a silver bullet, uh, a monoclonal antibody, or at least something they could attach either a radiation therapy or a chemotherapy that would go directly to cancer cells and kill them. Um, but unfortunately, monoclonal antibody technology had not yet reached uh, Harvard. And a serendipitous thing happened was that Dr. Knapp was invited by this gentleman, Sir John Stallworthy, to visit Oxford. Um, John Stallworthy was a New Zealand-born British obstetrician, uh, had been uh, twice the president of the Royal Society of Medicine. Their common interest was studying the way cancers spread through the lymphatic system. <clears throat> Dr. Stallworthy was interested in cervical cancer and nodal metastasis, Dr. Knapp in ovarian cancer, but he invited them to, to Oxford. Now, this is a serendipitous part of the story, is that Dr. Knapp's wife was raised in Europe, and his mother-in-law asked a favor of him before he went. She said, while you're there in Oxford, could you please go visit the Milstein boy? Well, it turned out the Milstein boy was Cesar Milstein. It was a son of a family friend whose family had moved to Argentina from Europe. And Milstein and the German cell biologist, George Kohler, had invented what's called hybridoma technology while working at Cambridge. And what a hybridoma is, is if you combine a B lymphocyte, which makes antibodies, and a myeloma cell, I'm sorry, uh, a myeloma cell, which produces, uh, uh, which is in, is, lives in perpetuity, you would end up having a way for making a specific monoclonal monoclonal antibody in perpetuity. It's a, a bit of a factory for a monoclonal antibody. And as you all know, monoclonal antibodies have revolutionized not only the treatment, but the diagnoses of diseases. And these two gentlemen won the Nobel Prize in 1984 for their work. Dr. Knapp has been looking for something like this to bring um, to the forefront for ovarian cancer treatment. So both he and Dr. Bass both traveled to Cambridge at different points to study with Dr. Milstein and brought the technology back to Boston. As I mentioned, Dr. Knapp is still operating, bringing clinical specimens back to the lab. Dr. Uh, Bast is trying to develop a monoclonal antibody against ovarian cancer. And this is a story of persistence because it didn't work with the many of the first attempts. But eventually, in 1981, they published their first paper showing reactivity of a monoclonal antibody against human ovarian carcinoma. And what they had developed was a monoclonal antibody that identified a portion of a glycoprotein called MUC16, which is on the surface mainly of serous carcinomas. And for those um, who don't treat ovarian cancer, the majority of epithelial ovarian cancers are a type called serous cancer. And when they worked with this monoclonal antibody and tested it, what they found was that all six of the ovarian cancer cell lines that they had in their lab reacted with this monoclonal antibody, as well as 12 of 20 of the cryopreserved ovarian cancer tumor specimens. But when they looked at non-ovarian cancer cell lines, like melanoma, cervical cancers, only one of 14 non-ovarian cancer cell lines reacted with it. So it seemed on the surface to be pretty specific for ovarian cancer. It did not react with normal adult or fetal ovarian tissue. Um, or a variety of other benign tissues. It got its name CA125 because it's a carbohydrate antigen. It's a glycoprotein, but it was the 125th attempt at developing a monoclonal antibody, and that's why the name CA125. So it's a story of persistence uh, in there as well. You may wonder where does Miss McDonald come into this picture? And to find her, you have to look into uh, the materials and methods of that first uh, publication on the monoclonal antibody. Under preparation and screening of hybridomas, 
they mentioned that to produce this monoclonal immunoglobulin, they immunized BALB mice with an epithelial cell line, which they called OVCA433, which was established from a patient, EM, with serous papillary cyst adenocarcinoma. And that patient was, uh, was the patient that I'm mentioning, Ms. McDonald. And Dr. Knapp still remembers this patient uh, very vividly. And it's just an interesting story where, for some reason, her cancer was the one that established this monoclonal antibody, where so many others had not. And in fact, all the radioamino assays for CA125 that are still performed today use the monoclonal antibody that was developed from Ms. McDonald's cancer. It reminds me somewhat of the story of Henrietta Lacks, whose cervical cancer cells went on to establish the HeLa cell line. Um, so uh, I, there are times when patients have specific cancers that are special in some way that really uh, add to research and, and push medicine forward. And so many of us don't know their names, but I'm sure there are other stories of Henrietta Lacks's and uh, Miss McDonald's out there. As I mentioned before, Dr. Knapp and Dr. Bass wanted to use this monoclonal antibody as a magic bullet, and that was their first intention. And they used their mouse model and tried many different experiments with varying success, trying to use this for immunotherapy. But it was really the collaboration with a doctor named Dr. Zarowski from a company called Centacor that turned it from being a therapeutic idea to a diagnostic idea. Dr. Zarowski said, well, why don't you use that monoclonal antibody to develop a radioimmunoassay blood test? Maybe if you can measure the amount of this CA125 in the blood of patients, it may have some clinical utility. And so they developed this radioimmunoassay, and OC125 was the monoclonal antibody used. The name of that test was CA125, and it is the backbone of the test we use today. One of the first studies, um, and, and probably the most impactful at this point, was published uh, on using this radioimmunoassay as a monitor for the course of epithelial ovarian cancer. <laughs> And in this case, they had 38 women with ovarian cancers that they followed throughout their treatment, and they got serial uh, levels of CA125, and what they found was that, I'm sorry, I should first mention how they came up with the cutoff of, of abnormal uh, levels. They uh, were able to get their hands on a number of, of samples. 888 samples came from the Southeastern Blood Center in Milwaukee. These were apparently healthy men and women. They got another 200 blood samples from the NIH. These were um, 200 samples from patients with non-gynecologic malignancies and 143 samples from patients with non-malignant diseases. And they had their own serum, database, uh, serum sample base at uh, Dana-Farber of 101 serum samples of women with ovarian cancer. And putting all these together, what they found was that if you use the cutoff of 35 units per mil, only 1% of healthy donors had a level of CA125 above this. And that's how the cutoff um, became 35 for that initial assay. But when you looked at the women who had ovarian cancer, 88 out of 101 women with ovarian cancer had CA125 levels that were greater than 35 units per mil. That established that cutoff. When they looked to monitor the course of ovarian cancer, what they found was that if you consider a having or a doubling of the CA125 level as evidence of regression or progression, if it decreased, they found that the vast majority of patients had clinical evidence of uh, regression of their disease. If it remained stable, less than having or less than doubling, the majority of patients had stable disease on clinical evaluation. And if your CA125 is in fact doubling, that all of the patients have progression of their disease. And so in this early study, what they found was what is still the most useful, um, uh, most impactful use for CA125 is monitoring the course of women who have uh, ovarian cancer to see how they're responding to therapy. But you can imagine their excitement because now armed with this test, it really opened up all these potential uses for serum CA125 tests. They knew it monitored response to ovarian cancer treatment, but 
Perhaps it could be used for screening of asymptomatic women for early detection of ovarian cancer. This is a disease that has often very vague and nonspecific symptoms, so that's a great uh, thing if you can develop one. It could be potentially used for the surveillance of women who had been treated for ovarian cancer for the early detection of the currents. And it could potentially be used for what I'm here to talk about today, which is the preoperative evaluation of women who present with a suspicious pelvic mass. Well, the problem with ovarian cystic masses is they're so common, and yet so few of them are cancers. Annually in the United States, there's millions of ovarian cystic tumors, but only about 22,000 ovarian cancers are diagnosed. And if you combine the data from the University of Kentucky ovarian cancer screening trial with the uh, census data from around the same time, what you find is that there are about 90 million American women from age 13 to 50. And the University of Kentucky screening trial says about 14% of them will get a cyst per year. That's 13 million women. And there's a prevalence of about 30% of women in that age group with cysts. So that's about 27 million premenopausal women at any time with an ovarian cyst. For postmenopausal women using greater than age 50, there's about 30 million women in this group. About 5% will get a cyst per year. That's 1.5 million women, and about 16% have a cyst at any given time. So as you can see, there are millions of women with cysts, and yet we're really trying to pick out the needle in the haystack to figure out which ones are cancer. Now, you may ask, well, why is it so important to know who has cancer? And uh, I think one of the obvious reasons is that it really dep uh, it really uh, helps to be in the hands of a G1 oncologist for your care. And I'm going to share some data with you. Uh, myself as a G1 oncologist, I'm, I'm well aware of these benefits. One of the first benefits is, if you can imagine, a lot of these women are presenting with just a mass on their ovary. And ovarian cancer is a tumor that can spread uh, lymphatically or through the peritoneal cavity and have no obvious signs of spread. You have to surgically stage that patient to determine who's stage one, two, or three. And that staging determines who's going to get adjuvant therapy in the form of chemotherapy. So going to a doctor who doesn't completely stage you misses an opportunity for a potential life-saving adjuvant chemotherapy. And this study by McGowan in 1985 just uh, really showed this well. 291 patients in this study with early stage ovarian cancer. And they looked to see how often were they completely staged. Complete staging for ovarian cancer involves not just the removal of the uterus and the tubes and ovaries, but sampling of the pelvic and parotid lymph nodes, biopsies of the intraperitoneal surfaces. 97% of gynecologic oncologists completely surgically staged. Only 52% of general obstetrician gynecologists, but they even did better than general surgeons who completely staged only 35% of the patients in this study. Now, the real test is the impact on survival. And there are a number of studies showing this, but I'm going to present these two. One is the Utah Cancer Registry, which looked at a large number of women um, with ovar new ovarian cancers between 1992 and 1998. One of the saddest things that this study showed is that the majority of women with ovarian cancer in this country are not treated by G1 oncologists. And in this study, only 39% were ever seen by a G1 oncologist. But for those women who were cared for by a G1 oncologist, those with advanced disease had an, a significant survival advantage. The median survival for those patients was 26 months versus 15 months for those who had not been cared for by a G1 oncologist. And the second study, the guided meta-analysis, is a, is a meta-analysis of 18 studies, and it showed the same thing. There was a market benefit for having a G1 oncologist involved in your care. Um, oncologists did more complete surgical staging for early-stage disease. They were more aggressive surgically for those with advanced disease and were able to achieve what we call an optimal cytoreduction, meaning they had all their metastatic tumor removed at a higher rate. Um, and you saw improved median and overall survival. So it's critical to get these patients with a suspicious adnexal mass into the right hands for these survival reasons. But what are the tools that any doctor has at their hands to determine whether a mass on an ovary is benign or malignant? You have physical exam, that'll be a pelvic exam, an abdominal exam, and a lymph node survey. 
You've got imaging modalities like sonogram, MRI, CAT scans. And I want to focus on serum biomarkers or algorithms that combine biomarkers with menopausal status. So let's start with CA125. As you know, it, I, I mentioned in this, uh, Dr. Knapp's early study, it was expressed in 80% of the ovarian cancers in their initial trial. But the thing you have to pay attention to is that the majority of patients with ovarian cancer, because of nonspecific symptoms and because of a lack of a uh, effective screen, present with advanced stage disease. Um, so it was uh, elevated in the majority of patients with advanced stage disease, but again, it was also limited by cell type. Uh, CA125 is most highly expressed in serous tumors, which are the majority, but poorly expressed in other non-serous types like ovarian mucinous tumors, clear cell, undifferentiated, and sarcomatoid malignancies, where its use is limited. Um, where we really want to pick up these cases where we think we'd have the biggest impact on survival is early stage. And early studies by Bast and Jacobs also show that it's limited there as well. CA125 is elevated in only half of women with early stage ovarian cancer. Um, so again, it's, it's approved for monitoring, um, uh, uh, cleared for monitoring for recurrence or progression of ovarian cancer in this country, but it's not clear to evaluate ovarian masses prior to surgery despite that being a very common use of the test. This study by Malkasian and Dr. Knapp's group in 1988 showed some of the limitations of CA125 here. In this study, they had 158 women with pelvic masses who were scheduled for surgery. 90 ended up being benign, 68 had malignancy, and they used actually a CA125 cutoff of 65 um, to determine whether they thought it was benign or malignant. And that cutoff was significant in only 8% of benign patients and 75% of malignant masses. And so CA125 had a 91% sensitivity for detecting cancer and a positive predictive value for postmenopausal women, with which, which was pretty high, it was 98%. But you see some of the weakness when you look at the premenopausal women, where there was only a 49% positive predictive value, meaning that if your test was abnormal, you actually had the disease. And, and this is because predictive values are impacted by prevalence of cancer in that population. And the prevalence of cancer in the postmenopausal women was 63%, but only 15% in the premenopausal women. So this highlights one of the limitations of CA125 in that it is not very specific for ovarian cancer. There are a number of gynecologic and non-gynecologic conditions that can elevate your CA125. In fact, for the gynecologic conditions, some of them are very, very common things like uterine fibroids, adenomyosis, endometriosis, infections, um, non-gynecologic things like congestive heart failure, uh, liver and kidney disease can do it. So um, it is hampered by this lack of specificity. So what kind of guidance do we have for when a general OBGYN should send a patient with an adnexal mass to a GYN oncologist. For that, we do have some recommendations by the American Congress of, of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Um, and there's Practice Bulletin 174, which was just updated in November of 2016. And it outlines referral criteria for women with adnexal masses when they should be sent on to a GYN oncologist. If you see for postmenopausal women, a CA125 greater than 35 is an indication to send that patient to a G1 oncologist because of its high positive predictive value. Um, now, other findings such as a sono that's very suggestive of malignancy or obvious evidence of metastatic disease, clearly those patients should be going on to an oncologist. But look at the premenopausal women where we see the vast majority of adnexal masses will, will occur in this country. There is no specific cutoff of CA125 that should send the patient to a G1 oncologist. In fact, the most recent update just says a very elevated CA125. In the 2007 bulletin, they had chosen 200 as a cutoff of CA125. That, that was based on largely um, expert opinion and not really well-designed studies. And so we have this guidance where if you're postmenopausal with any elevation of CA125, you go to a G1 oncologist, at least according to ACOG criteria. But if you're premenopausal, it has to be just, quote, unquote, very elevated. 
both um, premenopausal and postmenopausal women, uh, I should mention that you see on this slide, the last uh, element on the recommendations is an elevated score on a formal risk assessment test. And let's go through what is a formal risk assessment test. Well, there are three FDA cleared formal risk assessment scoring tests. There's the risk of malignancy algorithm. There's what's called the multivariate index assay or over one. And now there's a second generation multivariate index assay or OVERA. And I wanna go through each three of those to show you what they're made of and how they perform in this setting. So to start off the conversation on HE4, I'm sorry, on Roma, I have to tell you about this novel tumor marker, human epididymis 4. Um, HE4 was first identified as a specific protein in the human epididymis in 1991, and then shown to be overexpressed in ovarian cancer in 1999. It was shown to be a, a biomarker as a serum test in ovarian cancer by Hellstrom in 2002. Not a lot known about HE4's normal function. It's an N glycosylated protein. It's thought to have some anti protease activity, although the target protease is not identified. It's thought to play some role in sperm maturation and the normal epididymis and plays some sort of anti inflammatory response to cancer development. One of the benefits of HE4, though, is its um, distribution of expression in ovarian cancer, where CA125 is mainly expressed in serous ovarian cancer, what you see is that HE4 antigen is highly expressed in serous endometrioid and clear cell ovarian cancer, but like CA125, is rarely expressed in mucinous germ cell or sex cord ovarian cancer tumors. So you have a wider spectrum of expression in ovarian cancer. So HE4 is used along with CA125 and a woman's menopausal status to determine what's called the risk of malignancy algorithm. And this is a uh, algorithm that has been published. You can uh, get calculators online that will do this calculation for you. But the predictive index is different whether you're a premenopausal woman or a postmenopausal woman. For, for premenopausal women, the PI is minus 12 plus 2.38 times the natural log of HE4 plus 0.0626 times the natural log of CA125. And in postmenopausal women, it's minus 8.09 plus 1.04 times the natural log of HE4 plus 0.732 times the natural log of CA125. And I'm telling you the, the formulas because what I want you to notice is that in premenopausal women, you see the impact of CA125 being brought down by this 0.06 coefficient in front of it. Whereas in the postmenopausal women, you see a 0.7 in front of the natural log of CA125. And it shows you that um, the risk of malignancy algorithm is is leveraging the impact of CA125's uh, performance in postmenopausal women and HE4's performance in premenopausal women. Um, the ROMA is the exponential of the PI over one plus the exponent of the PI times 10. And that gives you an odds ratio. And there's a cutoff that says this patient is high risk or low risk for this adnexal mass being a cancer based on these three things, CA125, HE4 and menopausal status. This test, ROMA, was um, validated in two different studies. One was a study that was conducted mainly with GYN oncologists, and it was a high likelihood cohort because the cancer incidence, as you would expect in the hands of oncologists, was higher, it was 24%. And a second study in a low likelihood cohort that was carried out in 13 tertiary care and community sites um, where the cancer incidence was only 10%. What's interesting, if you look at the Roma performance in the high-risk population, it's exciting to see that in patients who are stage one and two, it correctly identified 30 out of 35 of the cases, or 86%. If you remember what I mentioned about CA125, only 50% of, of patients with stage one or two ovarian cancer have elevated CA125. So ROMA is a huge improvement for early stage detection uh, compared to CA125 alone. And for advanced stages, it picked up 
of cases uh, correctly identified. And so if you look at all invasive epithelial ovarian cancers, you see about a 94% sensitivity with Roma. In the low-risk population, you see similar numbers. There, the detection rate was about 93.8%, similar to the high-risk. Um, what's important to know here is that the specificity was fixed at 75% to achieve that sensitivity in both pre- and postmenopausal women. So the low specificity of CA125 in premenopausal women can be overcome using uh, Roma. And that this model can be used to effectively triage patients to centers of excellence for all the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Now, it's important to notice that the FDA clearance for Roma is for a woman who's greater than 18 years of age in which you, you've already decided you're going to operate on this ovarian cyst. It's not a test that's meant to tell you whether or not to operate on the cyst. It's a test that tells you, should you be doing that surgery if you're a general obstetrician gynecologist, or should you be referring that patient on to a gynecologic oncologist? In 2011, Dr. Knapp and I um, did a subset analysis of these, these two cohorts, and we were looking to see how uh, HE4 um, did just in premenopausal women um, because we believe that's where our true value add is. And it was an interesting finding. We, we had 229 premenopausal women with had nexal masses, the majority being benign, 85%, but 8% of them had epithelial ovarian cancer, and 7% had borderline ovarian tumors. The CA125 sensitivity was 83%, and the, fifth, and the specificity was 59%. But HE4 had a higher sensitivity of 88.9%. And what we were really uh, interested in was the specificity. It was 91.8%. And what we found is if you were a premenopausal woman in this study set, if you had a uh, elevated, um, if you had a normal HE4, regardless of what your CA125 said, it ruled out cancer in 98% of the patients. So even if you had an elevated CA125, a normal HE4 could be used to um, further risk stratify. OVA-1 is a similar test. It, it's uh, where Roma has just two analytes. OVA-1 um, is, is made up of five different serum tests. Um, that's transthyretin, apolipoprotein A1, beta-2 microglobulin, transferrin, and CA-125. So um, it is also FDA cleared for women greater than 18 years of age with in, uh, at next mass for whom surgery is also indicated. So it's not, again, to tell you who to operate on and who not to operate on. It's a triage tool. In the over one registration trial, it was a large study with 590 women greater than 18 years of age, came from 27 primary care and specialty sites, um, and they correlated the over one results with physician assessment and pathology results. Now, the algorithm that OVA1 uses to uh, calculate the risk stratification is not published. It's proprietary. So you don't know exactly the results of any individual um, analyte in the test. Um, they had 161 malignancies identified, 27% uh, were cancers. Similar to Aroma, there was a 93% sensitivity, but the specificity was 43%. Um, the positive predictive value was 42% and a negative predictive value of 92%. So similar sensitivity in the original registration trial, slightly lower, uh, lower specificity, um, but they were able to show that it did improve physician assessment for both GYNOX and non-GYNOX, that over one was able to pick up cases that were read as likely benign uh, by physician assessment and were actually cancers. Overwoman is validated in a large study, a prospective multi-institutional study um, that compared over one and CA125 in clinical uh, impression. Slightly lower incidence of cancer in this population, 18.6, um, but over one sensitivity for all ovarian malignancies, again, performed well, 95% sensitive. Um, it correctly classified 83% of cancers missed by clinical impression and 70% missed by CA125. And it predicted benign disease in 50% when combined with clinical impression. The specificity, again, was slightly lower than what we saw with Roma at 54%.
and a positive predictive value of 31%. And concerns about the low specificity of OVA1 led to the second generation of the uh, multivariate uh, uh, study. And this is called OVERA or OVA2. And in OVERA, what happens is they replace transthyretin with HE4 and beta-2 macroglobulin with FSH. And the goal was to increase the specificity and the positive predictive value while maintaining the excellent sensitivity and negative predictive value that had already been established. Where Roma uses two different uh, calculations for premenopausal and postmenopausal, the fact that follicle stimulating hormone is in over two, overa, it removes the need to include menopausal status because that will control for menopausal status. Um, the validation study of overa used a bank serum sample from a prospective cohort of 493 women undergoing surgery for a nexal mass, 18% uh, had cancer. When they combined OVERA score with physician assessment, the sensitivity remained excellent at 94%, but the specificity was increased to 69%. If you remember, it was only 54% for over one, so this was a significant improvement. Um, and the OVERA positive predictive value increased to 40%, whereas over one was, 40, was 31%. So this is an improvement over the first generation uh, uh, MIA and gives excellent sensitivity and specificity. So accurate triage of invasive ovarian cancer patients to appropriately trained clinicians is associated with improved outcomes. I showed you data on comprehensive staging, improved uh, surgical debulking, and ultimately better survival. And while CA125 is effective for monitoring response to ovarian cancer treatment, as shown in Dr. Knapp's early studies, it has limited sensitivity and specificity for the detection of malignancy in women presenting with an adnexal mass, one of the reasons why it is not cleared for this indication. But we have, we, we have better tests now. We have Roma, OVA1, and OVERA, all three FDA-cleared tests that can increase the detection of malignancy preoperatively and allow appropriate triage to gynecologic oncologists and thereby giving the patients this improved survival associated with their care. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, this picture is taken at Dr. Knapp's 90th birthday uh, celebration where my wife and I met with he and his friend and um, had a, a, a wonderful dinner together. And so I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about serum biomarkers and ovarian cancer and give you a bit of the history and the development of CA 125. I'd like to open the floor to any questions. Thank you, Dr. Holcomb, for that outstanding presentation. We will now move into the live Q&A portion of the presentation. As a reminder, please submit your questions via the Q&A box. Now let's get started. Our first question is, are formal cancer risk assessment tools widely utilized by general gynecologists when managing adnexal masses? You know, I, I wish I could say yes, that they are. But, um, and I'm, I'm sure there's some regional differences, and I have to admit I, I practice in the Northeast and, and may be different in other parts of the country. But I can say uh, my clinical experience is that they're underutilized. Um, I think many people, many general OBGYNs are trained that CA125 is the go-to test in this situation and, um, and may not be aware of the limitations of CA125, whereas patients are, uh, and, and I should mention that it's, it's, it's really leading to decisions not just on triage, who should be doing a surgery, but how, um, how important it is for the surgery to be performed in the first place. For example, someone may have a fairly suspicious adnexal mass and their practitioner is relieved by a normal CA125 and they'll say, well, uh, you know, the patient doesn't want surgery, maybe we can just follow this, where their gut was telling them that this is based on morphology, on the imaging, and yet they are uh, relieved. And the converse I've seen, I've seen patients with a, a simple cyst that has very little risk of malignancy. And the woman may have a history of endometriosis or a history of fibroids. And there's other reasons why her CA125 will be elevated. And because of an elevated CA125, there will be recommended surgery. Um, so I think, uh, you know, they're underutilized. 
I, uh, a lot of patients, as you saw from the Utah Registry study, um, are diagnosed with ovarian cancer and never having a G1 oncologist involved in their care. So I think, you know, it, it, it really is a, um, a responsibility of, of G1 oncologists and, you know, the medical community to sort of get this information out to doctors that there are tests that do much better than CA125 alone and, and really explain to them the, the way it should be used. So our next question is going to be, where do we stand with the development of an effective ovarian cancer screening test? So, you know, I, I, that's the holy grail of ovarian cancer. I mean, we're talking about a disease that has uh, at least epithelial ovarian cancer, such bad survival because it's, it's advanced stage for the majority of patients when we pick it up. And, you know, there have been a number of trials that have used CA125 as a straight cutoff of 35 and that being a trigger to do a sonogram. And I think it's fair to say that that type of screening, while it can pick up ovarian cancer cases, has not been proven to um, decrease mortality of the disease. Um, there was a study in the United Kingdom that was published a couple of years ago where they used the same tools, but in a different way. Um, they used the small changes in CA125 that occurred from year to year uh, to determine the risk of cancer and let that be the, uh, the trigger for sonograms. And, and there is some evidence that after multiple cycles of screening, there may be some improvement in, in um, mortality associated with that screening. But overall, I, I'd say the search for that, that uh, holy grail is still continuing. And there's a lot of really innovative things that people are doing. Um, a lot of attention being paid to what's called proximate fluids where uh, people are testing not the blood, but uh, fluid in the fallopian tubes uh, or in the uterine cavity. I've seen studies where they actually implant sensors in those areas to give real-time data on multiple analytes. Um, so a lot of work still going on, but it's an elusive goal, this uh, effective screen. And Dr. Holcomb, it looks like we have time for one more question. Have there been substantial advances in the treatment of ovarian cancer? Um, I'd have to say yes. Um, and, I, and I know a lot of people say we're not winning the, the battle on cancer. And I think if you look at a endpoint like 10 year survival in ovarian cancer, you would see some stagnation. But when I looked at, uh, for example, the, universe, uh, the Utah Registry study where G1 oncologists being involved in your care gave you an improvement of survival, and those patients only had 26 months median survival. Um, you know, we don't see that nowadays. We're seeing, you know, patients live four years, five years, and some of it is aggressive uh, surgical technique, but I think even more so, it's having more therapeutic options, medical therapeutic options. And probably the biggest impact I've seen is the introduction of PARP inhibitors. Um, PARP inhibitors as maintenance therapy. And it, it's just one of those therapies, it seems that the earlier you move it into a woman's care with ovarian cancer, the bigger the impact. And uh, just recently, there have been a number of studies where they were using PARP inhibitors as maintenance therapy after someone goes into their first remission and finding years of improvement in uh, progression-free survival, which I'm sure will have huge impacts on overall survival as that data matures. So, you know, I'd have to say, yes, um, I'm optimistic that we are seeing improvements. Thank you again, Dr. Kevin Holcomb, and thank you to the audience for your outstanding questions. We hope you found today's presentation to be informative and insightful. This presentation will be available for on-demand viewing. Don't miss out on other valuable presentations on our agenda please visit the Agenda tab in the auditorium for a full listing. Thank you again for your participation, and until next time, goodbye.